Christ dwell in you richly. Let the, the word, the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And let the word of Christ, that word, let that dwell in you richly. And let it dwell, let it dwell in you. And let it dwell in you richly. See, all those are very important yeah. words. I, I, I love the precision by which the Holy Spirit speaks. These are, these are such marvelous things. So that's our text for this morning. The power by which God accomplishes salvation is accessible through a particular message. And it isn't just any message. It is the message of the gospel of Christ Jesus. The gospel of Christ, the Spirit says, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. God doesn't work through every message. He works through the word of Christ. I am astounded by how much confusion there is about the gospel. Even now in the day when the true light now shines, there are still a lot of questions and confusion about the gospel. When I was down in Florida, maybe Brother Jeremy and Sister Nikki will remember this, a man came to our fellowship, and he seemed to be pretty attentive to what, what, what I was talking about. And uh, he said he wanted to meet with me personally over lunch, talk to me about something. So I went. And what he was is one of those end timers, the wrong kind of an end timer. He, he wanted to talk about tribulation and trouble that was coming, and we got to tell this to the people of God to get them ready. And I said, Brother, we... It's not that we shouldn't say those things, but that can't be the emphasis of our message because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. As we began to talk, I began to realize he doesn't know what the gospel is. Mm -hmm. So I said, do you know what the gospel is? And he said, no, what's the gospel? I said, you're telling me God sent you to tell us something? You don't even know what the gospel is? There's a lot of people that don't know what the gospel is. Amen. They don't understand this, mm -hmm. brethren. The word of Christ is the gospel, and that's what I want to declare unto you this morning. It is also astounding to me how much confusion over there is about what people think God is actually doing. God wants you to have your best life now. That's a gospel. It's not. This isn't the gospel, but it is a gospel that's being propagated out there. Is that the message God works through? God wants you to have your best life now. Obedience is the key to divine blessing. A lot of people hearing that today. That's, that's a gospel. It's out there. But is that the gospel? Hmm? Does God save you on the basis of what you do, or does he save you on the basis of what Jesus did? Which one is it? Or how about this one? Jesus is going to set up a kingdom on the earth. Is that really where our hope lies? is in some tangible kingdom in the world that Jesus is going to set up? Is that where our hope lies? Is that what the gospel talks about? Is the emphasis of the gospel tangibles or untangibles? Is the emphasis of it things that are seen or things that are not seen? What is it? Amen. Brethren, these are gospels that are going out, but God isn't working through these words. Spiritual progress is a product of good discipline and a right routine. I used to be, I used to swallow that one. You know about that discipline that's going around right now on the internet? I don't know what it is, 365 days of Thanksgiving and they give a Thanksgiving. It's astounding what men think of. It's like after 200, they don't know what to say and so they just stop. I thank God for the coffee I had today and just stupid stuff. I mean, come on. I'm not against giving thanks, but if you think that power is given to you from God because you're giving thanksgiving like that in a ritualistic, routine, impersonal, which is what I think it is, that's not the gospel. Or how about this one that's a little more subtle? This is one Paul had to deal with. You must be circumcised and keep the law to be saved. Is that the gospel? But it was said to be when that word was going among the Gentiles and it was going to overthrow their faith. Paul had to labor greatly for the Galatians in pain and labor again until Christ be formed in you because they were being turned aside 
by a message that was said to be the gospel. But I'll tell you what, in all of these words, nobody is being changed by them. Because there is one message by which God works. And we call it the Word of Christ. And I figure if we're going to keep this exhortation to let it dwell in us richly, it's incumbent upon us to know what he's talking about. And brethren, I know today I'm, probably, I'm not, I'm not going to say anything you haven't seen. I think people that try to be profound end up being foolish. I, that's not my desire. My desire is to do like what Peter did and to remind you to stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance because I understand this to be safe. And so that's what I want to do this morning. Okay? I think... All the misconceptions about the Father, all the misconceptions about salvation are owing to the fact that men have the wrong focus when they come into the Scriptures. You see, the knowledge of Christ is like the secret that unlocks the Scriptures. And that unlocks the knowledge of the Father. That's, that's the light that shines out, that gives understanding in all these areas, is the knowledge of Christ. Okay? We have to know Christ if we're going to know anything. That has to be a central issue. The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. See, there's a, there's a light that shines out from the gospel. And in thy light we see light. And that is the light that gives understanding. What is it? It's the gospel of Christ. And so he says, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. To give us what? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of of Jesus Christ. Amen. See, misunderstandings happen because G people aren't looking into the face of Jesus. Amen. That's what's happening. There are a lot of Gospels out there that won't turn your attention to the face of Jesus. But if you are going, brethren, to understand the work of God in salvation, if you're going to understand the Father, you're going to have to be full face focused upon Jesus. Yeah. And that's what the Gospel is. It's the Word of God. Christ. That's what it is. The Word of Christ. It is encapsulated in this. It is the message or the news of what God has accomplished in salvation through one man, the man Christ Jesus. That's what it is. So let me just say that. I'll just break that down. What do you mean by that? Well, I'm saying this. The Word of Christ is not a theory. It's a reality. It's not the surmising of what we think is. It's the true, unshakable reality of what is. That's what it is. I thought of this example in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 13. You may recall when uh, Herod pursues after the child Jesus. The angel comes to Joseph and says, remember in a dream, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be thou there until I bring thee word. And so you may recall they did. They fled off into Egypt. But what was that word when it came back? Verse 20, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. He told him, in reality, what had happened. That's what it was. It wasn't a theory about what I think, I think this might have happened. I'm not sure if this happened. It wasn't that. It was the reality of what had happened. Amen. Now that's what the word is. It's what a word is. It's news, brethren. It's the news of what actually happened, okay? It's amazing how much preaching really is theoretical. It's not real. It's amazing how much preaching has more to do with routines and disciplines. You know, I hate the should gospel. I just, it's not right. The should gospel and the try hard gospel. This, this not right. Well, we should be, but we aren't, but we ought to be. What is that? It's a proclamation of what isn't. Yeah. But we hope it, it, it will be, but, but it isn't. And you know how we should? God doesn't work through that kind of message. Amen. 
Because the message of the gospel is a declaration of a substantive reality of what is. Yeah, it's what is. Amen. It's the word of Christ. The word of Christ. I'll give you an example. Acts chapter 3, verse 18 to 21. Here's the gospel. Those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. What is that? It's a bunch of realities. Yeah. Yes. It's a bunch of realities. That Christ should suffer, that was a very real suffering. That's a reality. It's a, that's not fictitious. It's a real thing. That repentance, repent you therefore be converted that your sins, is sin real? Sin's real. That's real. It's not a theory. It's real. Maybe blotted out. Is forgiveness real? Is being blotted out, is that real? Yeah. Huh? Or is it some kind of a psychological brainwashing? Do you kind of convince yourself that somehow now God is going to forgive me? No, it's not that. It's real. It's real. Cleansing from sin is real. Amen. There's a real fountain open for uncleanness and sin. Amen. Sins are really put away. See, these are all realities. These are realities. How about times of refreshing? Is that real? If you had a time of refreshing, it's real. These are all real things. They're not theories. They're real things. The presence of the Lord is real. It's real. He shall send Jesus Christ. It is amazing that we have to come to this in a day like this and say, Jesus Christ is real. Mm -hmm. Brethren, I don't think a lot of people are associating the Word of God or preaching with reality. Yeah. The truth of the matter is if you are truly, if, if the assessment of the brethren is true, and this has gone on a number of times, that we are living in an unbelieving society, then that is the case. The only way to come to the knowledge of unseen realities is by faith. It is the substance of things hoped for. So if we are truly dealing with a faithless, faithless generation, then don't be surprised that they glory in theorizing because it's not really real to them. The gospel is real. Amen. And it's about real things. We talked about one of those this morning. The day of judgment is not a theory. It's not an idea. The kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. And I'm telling you, the word of Christ is powerful and real. Amen. It's real. So it is that. It is not a theory. It is, in fact, a reality. Think of this. It's a message of what God has done to the exclusion of what men have done. Men talk too much about themselves. They talk too much about themselves. In light of our past, this should not be. Okay? And we're talking about the Christ, and God has spoken about the Christ, Isaiah 63, 4 and 5. The day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. I love that thought. And I looked, and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore my own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury, it upheld me. God looked over the entire human race of Adam, and sin had made the human race an utter and total wreckage. There is none righteous, no, not one. You see... As long as men believe there's something good in man, then they are never going to trust in the gospel of Christ Jesus. They will never trust, say, in the Christ of the gospel. They will provide gospels of their own. And maybe they'll come to Jesus and say things like this. What must I do to inherit eternal life? The gospel's not come home yet. His fury, it sustained him. He didn't get it from men. God doesn't take something theoretically good in men and add it to the gospel Amen. and save men with it. Yeah. There isn't anything good in man. Amen. When we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Amen. That's the gospel. Yeah. We were without strength. We were without strength. God, for his great love, where he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, 
even when we were dead. I mean, what can a dead man do? How many times have we said this here? People still believe they chose God. What kind of a choice can a dead man make? He didn't even choose his death, let alone anything after that. God. Amen. The gospel is not a declaration of some goodness in men. It's a declaration of God's goodness in providing a salvation through a Savior that He provided, the Christ. Amen. So you have to know, you know this. But I'll tell you, brother, and I'll tell you right now, the word Christ is not common language in the church. That ought to tell you that something's not right. People don't associate the name of Jesus with being the Christ. Because they don't have a good understanding of what the Christ is. Yeah. But if you're going to let the word of Christ dwell in you, then you've got to have an understanding of Christ. So by the way, the word of Christ is only accessible through the vehicle of understanding. Just so you know. <laughs> it is never going to dwell in you richly if you don't understand it. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And it will certainly be no profit to you unless you understand it. And so in light of that, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Okay? Let it dwell in you richly. It is a message of what God has done to the exclusion of what men have done. It is ex an exclusive message about an exclusive work. It is not centered in human need or want, but in divine purposing and God's will. You see, Christ is not a well for wishing. He's a man on a mission. Christ doesn't come to you and say, what do you want me to preach? What do you want me to do? I understand times he'll come and what do you want me to do for you? I understand that. But it's all within the context of God's will. Jesus never even said anything God didn't tell him to say. Amen. Jesus never did anything that God, God didn't, that he hadn't seen from the Father. In fact, one time a man came to him and tried to pull him off. This man sensed that Jesus was a judge, but boy, you've got to be careful what you say to this judge. You might be the one coming up in the before judgment, not your brother. Mm -hmm. So he said, "Tell my brother to give me part of the give me the inheritance. Give me my part of the inheritance." Jesus said, "Who made me a judge over you?" Hey, Jesus won't be pulled aside. If men have some kind of a weird idea of what they think Amen. Jesus is doing, I'm sorry, but Jesus isn't going to be pulled aside because people have a wrong view of what Jesus is doing. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. He is doing the will of the Father. Yeah. He is God's Christ. Amen. And He is doing the will of the Father. Isaiah 42, 1-4. to Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. You see, Jesus is not your servant. He's God's servant. And he's doing the Father's will. See? That's what he's doing. I'm glad for it. Yeah. Acts 17, 30 and 31. I think this kind of word has to go out. There's got to be... There's a measure of boldness that is associated with the proclamation of gospel, that you are loosed from, the, from being concerned about what men want. That has to happen. It, you're, that, it's not that we're unfeeling about men, but we really, when it comes to what God is doing in salvation, no, we're not asking men what they want. I love this wonderful sermon that the Apostle Paul gave on Mars Hill. He said, the times of ignorance God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Amen. Amen. And then he gave the gospel. Yeah. Amen. Because he hath appointed a day yeah. in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. That's the gospel. Mm -hmm. Hey, this is a word that's got to go out. God's not asking anybody to repent. He's demanding that men do it. Amen. This word's got to go out. I understand this is a very un-American type of a proclamation. But God is not asking you about this. He is demanding that you do it. See, the gospel places demands on men. Gospel doesn't ask you what you want. Amen. The central thing in the gospel is what God wants. It's the word of Christ. Amen. Who is Christ? What kind of a significance do you know about Christ that's not directly connected with what God is doing? There isn't anything like it. 
Hey, he's here to do the Father's will, and he commands you to repent. That needs to go out with the proclamation of the gospel, brethren. You, may, you might say this isn't very seeker-friendly, but in one sense it is very seeker-friendly if you heed the call. You heed the call, okay? That's the gospel. What a, what a wonderful word that we have to proclaim. No wonder, brethren, it is such a reproach to not be bold about this word. We're not speaking for men here. We're speaking for God. When you boil it down, the gospel is a declaration of God's work by one man. Yes. Not by many men. It is not the word of men. It's the word of Christ. One man. One man. Be it known unto you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. One man. One man. And he went on to say, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders. Well, I guess we, we better do something else because everybody, everybody wants a different Savior. No, you set him at naught but you didn't move him at all. And he has become the head of the corner. If you reject the son, you don't have the father. Amen. This is the man by whom salvation is worked. And if you reject the man by whom salvation is worked, you have no hope of salvation. None whatsoever. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. See, that's what the gospel is. It's the declaration of what God has done through Christ. It's all over in the scriptures. I love it. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing our trespasses unto us. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And again, unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning every one of you from your iniquities. It's what God has done through Christ, and you become the beneficiary recipient of that. Yeah. That's what it is. See? Amen. We're not even in the foundation. You know where you were when the foundation was laid? We were all in trespasses and sins. And that's where the foundation was laid. We're not in the foundation. We're on the foundation, but we aren't the foundation. Okay? It is what God has done through Christ because if a man lifts up his tool on this altar, he defiles it. It's the word of Christ. It is in a detail the message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ according to the scriptures and the glory that has come from that. That's what it is. It's a marvelous thing that God has done. I just, you know, I went back and I just rehearsed some of the things associated with his death and the glorious things that have come from that. It is astounding how many marvelous things there are that are just associated with just the death of Christ. Yes. What the Spirit said, the sufferings of Christ and the glory, yeah, the glory that should follow. Now think of some of those glorious things. Galatians 1, 4, he delivered you from this present evil world by giving himself. Mm -hmm. By giving himself. Or how about this one? Hebrews 9.27, he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now I'm telling you, brethren, in all these things I'm telling you, do you realize that there is another gospel that has a substitute that proclaims to do this very thing? Yeah. I went down the street the other night. I was, I was doing my route, and I went down the street and saw a sign that said, Give thanks, because when you give thanks, it'll change you. Mm. Really? Is that so? Hmm? I'm amazed at how many professed Gospels there are that exclude Christ and yet promise the things that the Father said that Christ would bring. Yeah. Amen. Change, mm -hmm. salvation, deliverance from sin. Hmm? Just try this three-step plan and you'll, you'll quit that drinking. Yeah. Huh? Things like that, which by the way, you can quit drinking without, <laughs> without the Gospel. We're talking about bigger things than that, like resisting the devil and not loving the world, 
and overcoming. See, all these things are things that only Jesus can bring. He redeemed us from all iniquity and purified unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So if the church really is more like the world, then it's the testimony that Christ isn't working there. That's why he gave himself a peculiar people. People of God's own possession. Isaiah 53, 11 says he satisfied God. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. And let me tell you something. God won't ever be satisfied unless Jesus does a work. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Has to come through him. The gospel, brethren, is the gospel of the blessed God because of what Jesus did. Not because of what you did. It's because of what he did. Amen. He, God, shall see the travail of his soul, Amen. his son, and shall be satisfied. Amen. Satisfied. Through death, the scripture says that he destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. And many more things that are associated with that. But that, brethren, is the word of Christ. That's what it is. It's an announcement. It's a declaration of what God has accomplished in His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what it is. And the exhortation is this, to let this Word dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Okay? Let. I was interested in that. Let. There are a number of exhortations that have that in it. Let. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. Or let us hold fast our profession of faith without wavering. But in all these things, it's all a call to action. Yeah. Amen. It's action. Yeah. Brother, this is something you have to be intentional about. Mm -hmm. The Word of Christ is not going to automatically dwell in you richly. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. Okay? It's something that we are involved in. It's something that we are partakers of. We participate in letting the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. Okay? It's not just automatic. We involve ourselves in it. I'll tell you right now, when you came into Christ, you didn't have it in you richly. Sorry, you didn't. When it comes to an understanding of what was there, it's something that you have to grow in. Yeah, you were given an understanding. The Son of God has come and given us an understanding. But you just go back and rehearse what you knew when you first came in and consider what you know now. That required involvement. You involved yourself in the work. See? For example, the scripture says the seed is the word of God. I mean, I could have a 50 pound bag of seed, but if I don't ever plant it, it doesn't matter what the potential of it is. It's got to be planted. Okay? It's got to be planted. And that's what this is. We involve ourselves in this. Okay? Now I like this word dwell in you. Let me just affirm these, these few things. Dwell in you. Now I looked at this in the scriptures and I, uh, seeing what the Lord said about this and it is astounding. But the word works powerfully when it's dwelling in you. It works powerfully when it's dwelling in you. Not all men have let it dwell in them, or shall we say, remain with them. Some men have been like the seed on the scattered path. The seed went into their ears, but they didn't understand it. And so what happened? The devil came and took away what was sown in their heart. Now let this word dwell in you richly, brethren. Let it dwell in you richly. Make an effort to understand it. Understand what you've seen. Or as David would say, give me understanding. Mm. Amen. Give me understanding so that this won't be taken. Take it from me. James chapter 1 verse 21 says, Lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word that is able to save your souls. It's a good word. When it gets in you. Receive it with meekness. Don't come to the Word of God with, a, with some large personal agenda. You don't do that. You come with the Lord, what, what the Lord is doing in mind. You come with that kind of a meekness. I, it is astounding to me. Some men, what they bring out of the Scriptures when they go into it. 
A man could come out of Daniel and he's got some strange idea of an earthly kingdom God's going to set up. Strange. Strange things. We want to come to it with meekness because when it's dwelling in you, or as Jesus would say, he said, let these sayings sink down into your ears. Don't ever give a casual hearing to the Word of God. We want that Word to make a, a, a transition down into the heart. Amen. Amen. Let it dwell in you richly. Because I'm telling you, when the Word dwells in you, it works powerfully and effectually. When the Word of God came to our brethren at Ephesus, you may recall of a circumstance that arose there, seven sons of Sceva, who were Jewish sorcerers. Strangest thing. They thought they would take upon themselves the kind of power the Apostle Paul had. So they said, we adjure you by the Christ that Paul preaches. You remember what happened. They went out of that house bleeding and broken. Yeah. And the scripture says that fear came upon all the people. And it was this very occasion that the impact of the gospel was realized. It said, many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. And this is the Spirit's commentary. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Mm -hmm. What was that? That was the word. That was what happened when people received the word by faith, Amen. the word of Christ. They brought these books. These were people that were taken captive by the wicked one at his own will. Satan didn't want these books burned, but they were freed by the word dwelling in them. See? And they brought those books and burned them. What a marvelous liberty. It is amazing, this wonderful gospel. Jesus said one time, he says, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, that's when the word of Christ is dwelling in you. Hmm? It's when you know it. When you know it, then you got it. Mm -hmm. See? It's dwelling in you, but it powerfully works. It makes you free. See? We don't associate our freedom with a routine or a procedure of men. We associate it with the word of Christ. That's where that freedom has come from. Okay? It's when that word has gotten into us. Paul wrote to the Colossians and he said, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come unto you, as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it does also in you, since, you do, since the day you heard it and knew the grace of God in truth, when it was in them, then it bore fruit. Mm -hmm. Bore fruit. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I like that. The word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. What does it mean for the word of Christ to dwell in you richly in all wisdom? Okay, and this will be kind of the last thought I give to you today. What does that mean? The Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. It's when you have a thorough understanding of Christ. Let me say it a different way. It's when you can see Christ in every page of Scripture. Now there are people, the Jews were an example of this, who diligently studied the Scriptures, but they didn't come away with the Word of Christ. They didn't understand the scriptures. It's not that the scriptures are, it's not that the scriptures are, the, that the word of God is without effect. It's not that. And that's not what I'm saying, that somehow you can put the scripture aside and now you're going to come to the, it's not, the word of Christ isn't something independent from the scriptures. It is a focused message within the scriptures. See, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. But there are people that read their Bibles and they don't see Christ in it. But you do when you can see him in everything. Let me, give you, let me give you some examples of this. For example, Jesus himself said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
Now, when you go into that account of those Israelites murmuring and those fiery serpents being sent among them and that brazen snake being lifted up, now you could read that account and not know anything about Christ whatsoever. But when the word of Christ is dwelling in you richly, you read that differently. Amen. You come out of there thinking, Jesus is that serpent. He's the brazen one. He's the one that's lifted up. He's the one. See? It's when you see him. At, see, if truly, brother, if, if in truth the scriptures are written of him, then the scriptures actually assist us in letting this word dwell in us richly. They do. When you can see that Jesus is the coat of skins that covers our shame, then the word of Christ is dwelling in you richly. When you can see that he is our Moses that has led us out of the land of bondage, now the word of Christ is dwelling in you richly. When you see that he is our manna that sustains us in a land where there are no provisions, now you've got the message. Now you see the word of Christ and it's dwelling in you richly. When you can see that he is our Joseph that was hurt in fetters and was exalted to the place where the storehouse was so that he could provide corn to sustain his people. Now the word of Christ is dwelling in you richly. When you see that he is our Joshua and Caleb, and when they're at the foot of the land of Canaan, they say, we are well able to take the land. Don't you hear that when you hear the gospel? Say, we are well able. We are well able. So what is that? Jesus is our Joshua. He's our Joshua and he's our Caleb. When you see that he is our priest that puts his own foot into the Jordan River at high tide, so that you can make your final passage through the graves of death, through the grave, the watery grave as it's been called, into the land of Canaan. Now you've got the message of the scripture and the word of Christ is dwelling in you richly. When you see that he is our mercy seat, for it is there with him that we commune with God. Now the word of Christ is dwelling in you richly. When you see that he is our David who has charged the battlefield and taken the head of Goliath off. Now... Brethren, the word of Christ is dwelling in you richly when you see that he is truly the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, then it's dwelling in you richly. And on and on we could go. When you think of architecture, you think he's the stone. When you think of vegetation, you think he's the vine. When you think of a marriage, you think he's the husband. See, it's like in every context, Christ becomes the dominating consideration. And when that's happening, brethren, the word of Christ is dwelling in you richly. Now, it's our encouragement. I, I, there's something that uh, the Apostle Paul... Apostle Paul, I'm glad that he declared his desires for the brethren. I'm glad he did that. And uh, to the Colossians, he had this word to say. And this is a word for us, too, because he says, I would that you know the great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face. Now, that's us. Now, that's us, too. But here's what his desire was, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, and whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That is to say, brethren, that Paul was depending on the fact that the body as a whole was going to come to the understanding of Christ as they were knit together. Now, that's what we're seeing among us. That's what's happening here among us. You're seeing the brethren being knit together in love and a greater measure of assurance. Why? Because, brethren, what we're doing is we're discovering the knowledge of Christ together. That's what we're doing. That's what's happening among us. It's, it is a marvelous thing to behold. Our, we are letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly as an assembly. And I am thankful for that. I'll tell you, we talked about distractions this morning. A distraction is simply anything that turns you away from the Word of Christ, whatever it may be. It can be another gospel. It can be circumstances of life. It can be all manner of things. The entrance of, of, of a lust of other things. It can be all manner of things. But that's, that's what the devil's target is because he knows, brethren, if this Word of Christ dwells in you richly, everything that God has determined to come and pass will be realized by you.
by his people. It will be realized by all those who put their faith in the Son of God and who let this word dwell in them richly. So let me encourage you, commit this word to you. We're seeing progress in this area. And we just say, let's continue. Thank you, brother. Amen.